All right, hi guys. I'm gonna give it about 30 seconds before I introduce our very special and lovely guest. I hope you guys are hanging out comfortably. There's a lot to talk about. Um, but basically, before I even introduce uh, Daniel, I just wanted to say I wanted to get together with you guys because I know that these are difficult times. Hi guys. These are difficult times and we're trying so hard to get through them with our heads just above the water. We're trying so hard to let our friends, our neighbors, our family, you know, think that we're okay. But, you know, speaking and having deep conversations with my family and friends, I know that a lot of us are struggling. So our guest was brought to me beautifully by the universe. And I wanna introduce him because he can teach us so much in such a simple manner. He's just effortless at, at teaching um, ways on how you can keep yourself uplifted during this time. So let's hang out. Um, also, yeah, bring me some little hearts there. I wanna see some hearts. Yeah! <laughs> also, um, let me know where you're tuning in from. Leave your location and um, I'll go ahead and bring on our guest, Daniel Ballone. So excited. My first time doing an IG live too, so bear with me. Hi, Leslie. Oh. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. So nice to meet you. So nice to meet you too. I'm, I've been looking forward to this conversation longer than just Tuesday when we connected so magically. Yeah, that was a wonder, right? The, the ways of life and yeah, how we met is pretty awesome. <laughs> so where are you tuning in from right now? I'm in Beverly Hills. Okay, so you're in LA as well. Yes, I'm in LA. So I want to start the conversation off before I get into some questions with you because today's conversation, I want it to be very interactive. Whoever is watching right now, please feel free to drop comments, ask questions. This is going to be all about spirituality. It's going to be all about how we can enrich our lives during these, I call them dark times because many people are trapped in the dark moments of this quarantine. And I want to try and get as many people out of it and back into their true selves and true reality. So um, I was driving out to Orange County. I'm in LA. And this one day, Daniel, like no joke, I turned on the radio instead of my, my phone. I usually connect it to the Bluetooth. And I listened to the radio. I just thought I want to see what's on and what people are tuning into. And I was probably five miles from my home and you were on the radio you were being interviewed and and uh your words spoke so deeply with me it was like a talk radio but i could tell it was like higher conscious conversations and the one thing i took away from it at the very end was when you said and it was so simple you just said don't focus on what you don't want focus on what you want yes the way you said it i've heard it so many times i've taught it to students the way you said it, I've been repeating that as my mantra since then. So I, I said, I have to thank him for that beautiful, eloquent interview because it lifted me up and I DM'd you. Like I, I stopped you and I found you. <laughs> <laughs> and within hearing your interview, 20 minutes later, this manifested. I reached out to you. You responded right away and you said, hey, let's connect on IG Live. And my dream is to be able to speak with people like yourself and have a community to spread awareness and to have conversations without fear. You know, a lot of people tuning in right now aren't really into spirituality. Maybe they practice it once in a while, but I want to make it accessible to everyone. And I feel like you do that. So welcome to my first episode. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. As soon as I saw your Instagram there, I had this feeling, I think we should do this, you know, like an Instagram live and share this with, with the people and it all happened so fast. I think it's meant to be. I think so too. I think so too. So for those of you, Daniel, he is a mantra singer. He has been spreading higher consciousness through his music and he has a motto that he likes to kind of hold dear to his heart, which is awakening through music. And after I checked the website, I went to your YouTube. I was on your website for like three hours, you guys. His website is not only aesthetically beautiful, but it has so much free 
and powerful information on there. Um, I listened to your music all day and I read your blogs. So there's so much I want to talk to you about. But before we start, if anybody has any questions about what mantra music is or anything you have in your heart that you just want to share, please don't be shy. If you also want to, okay, if you want to let us know where you're tuning in from, Daniel's in Beverly Hills. I'm in, in LA. Just let us know where you're at. I, I always like to know because I can visually like be there with you for half a second. If you're in Canada and you tell me that, like I'm with you in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So Daniel, where do I start? Um, you've been on a spiritual journey for 15 years. Yes. And you, um, my question to you is this, because a lot of us, we're diving deep into spirituality and we're trying to connect with our true selves and true awareness. Um, but what shifted in your life to make you so completely devoted to higher consciousness and spreading light through your beautiful music? What happened? Yeah, I, it was suffering, basically. Suffering is what triggers the transformation. Because if there's no suffering, then you can continue with your life. Whatever it is, you just keep going. But when there's a lot of suffering, you reach a point where something needs to change. It doesn't work. So I was pursuing a career as an actor in Argentina for seven years, and it was not, it was not working, you know? It was not my path, and I was not getting enough interviews and jobs and bookings. So, and that has an explanation, because actually I'm the fourth kid in my family, and actually the first kid was a boy he was, uh, he had blue eyes and blonde hair. And even by the age of one year old, he was already being featured in magazines and he was so pretty. And my parents were so proud of him. He was like a, this baby. Bye. Yeah, exactly. And one day he passed away. Like he was two years old and my mom found him basically dead on the cradle. So it was a big shocker for all my family for years, many years. So then my parents had two uh girls basically my sisters and i was the fourth one again a boy so when my mom thought that she was going to get a boy she was thinking about <laughs> this little guy who left us and of course now she was 40 she was not 20 so when i i was born i had brown eyes brown hair i was much bigger and the first thing she said is like oh he's so ugly so you know Words have power, especially when you are born, there's a space of grace. The first six hours after you come out of the womb, whatever you are exposed to, because it's your first, con your first contact with the world, you get an impression in the unconscious mind that creates programs of, on how you will see life from there on. So somehow I felt rejected because of my physical appearance. I didn't know that, but that started... Uh, basically expressing when I was around 16, 17 years old, I started feeling that I needed that recognition for my beauty, that that would heal me. If I would get people say how beautiful you are, I would feel like, ah, oh, thank you. You know, I need that. So of course, if you are trying to pursue something from a place of suffering, whatever you find there is suffering. So that's what happened to me. I was just being rejected again and again because of that. And and it, it came to a point where it was so much that I felt like I want to be happy. I, I really want to connect with something that makes me feel happy and, and back to myself. I was a, such a joyful person throughout my life that I was missing that. So my friend invited me to a sweating, uh, sweating lodge ceremony in Argentina. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and that's but in, can you explain that really quick? That's where you, to people that may not know what it is. Yeah, it's basically like a meditation that is performed within a, a closed, um, like a little environment that is closed. It's, it's made of uh, tree like branches. Yeah, like a sauna. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but it's a ritual, you know, because there's a guide, usually it's a shaman, and he's kind of guiding a meditation. There are four doors for each element, and they invoke all these different directions and power animals. So anyway, I was there. And he started singing a mantra, and I had a mystical experience for the first time in my life. I saw the doors of a temple opening in front of my heart, physically. And I was like, 
what's going on here? This is crazy, you know? Like, uh, I never had anything like that before. And, you know, I was fasting the whole day. I just drank a little bit of water in the morning. That was it. So I said, I don't know what mantras are, but this definitely works. Mm-hmm. And uh, and made me happy. for I needed that for a long time. So after that, I decided to come back to this place again and to meet this that ended up being my mentor for many years. And he used to play mantras. He used to sing with his guitar and, and play mantras. Mm-hmm. So I, being a musician all my life, my desire was to play along with him just to honor him. Mm. I really didn't want to, I mean, I had no bigger intention than that. But as I was doing that, I was reconnecting with my true essence, with who I was, with the music, with, the, with you know, the devotion. For the first time, I started feeling devotion. Part. And that's how it all started. And from there on, it, it just picked up and I started sharing it more and more. I went to India. I was living in India mostly for the last 15 years, coming back and forth, back and forth and learning this amazing science that has changed my life. And I thought, okay, if it can make me happy, it can make everyone else happy too. So I need to share it. Yeah, I (laughs) definitely resonate with that feeling. It's like, as soon as I learn anything new, I want to share it with someone. Even if it's an expression that's authentic, I just have that innate nature. So I can feel that through you. And I feel like you're such a great teacher because it just hits the heart. So thank you for sharing that story. And mantra music, a lot of people don't know what that is. Um, And I wanna basically to break it down, you guys, because a lot of you don't know what it is. Mantra music is the yogi music. It's like the guy sitting there strumming that little guitar and the Zen music. And, um, but something I love about mantra music is how quickly it can shift the energy in any space like that. So it's kind of how like people listen to rap music and the first thing you do is like, hey, you know? (laughs) And mantra music is like, it penetrates through you. And mantra music is, it's sung in Sanskrit. And I absolutely love Sanskrit. So Sanskrit is um, the oldest tongue spoken in our existence. And it derived from India. And the special thing about, Sanskrit is that they have words that cannot even, there's no words for them in English or modern language. There's over a hundred words to say elephant, 70 words to say water. And even NASA, which I thought this was fascinating, the new supercomputer that they're programming is programmed in Sanskrit. And actual dialect hasn't changed since the beginning. Usually dialects change with time. It's the same. So Sanskrit is a dope language and it, even the letters are beautiful. Lots of people have it tatted on their arms. Like you may have seen yogis with that dialect, that's Sanskrit. So talk to us a little bit about Sanskrit and how for whatever reason, mantra music is, is sung in Sanskrit since, how old is Sanskrit? Talk to us a little bit about it. Well, they say at least 5,000 years old. 5,000 years old. But my guess is that it's even older. It's not really, only coming from India, this has been, this wisdom has been carried from even before, and it has gone to different parts of the world. And but basically, India kept it alive through their system of monks and, you know, disciples and devotion through yoga, basically. So our ancestors, because at the end of the day, we all have common ancestors. If we go back maybe 30 generations, we are all kind of coming from the same place. they were studying the relationship between sound and consciousness because they were living in the, in the previous golden age. And, you know, like we have seasons throughout the year here in this planet. There's, there are also seasons around bigger suns. And when we get close to those suns, then what happens is our understanding of what the divine is or God changes. We start having an experience of that. Uh, as a state of consciousness, not as a, I'm not talking about God as a being, more like a state of how we see and experience life, how we feel about life. Is that the golden age you're talking about? Yeah. So you have a quote on your website and it's the world needs a critical mass of dreamers who can see the golden age and therefore manifest. Yes. 
And I've been hearing a lot about the golden age. I didn't know what it was until the quarantine. So the golden age, and I feel it after doing some research and having teachers online that I follow and now you, can you speak to us about the golden age? And I feel like it has to do exactly with what you're talking about through suffering comes just a spiritual awakening because it forces us to deal with all of the ugly and the negativity. So speak to us a little bit about the golden age and how the duality of all of the isolation and changing of social norms can come about of this golden age. Yes. So basically when we realize that we are creators of our own destinies, not only through the actions that we perform externally, but through the visions that we hold internally. When enough people awaken to this reality that whatever you hold in your consciousness, it could be anything. It could be the, the most uh, far-fetched dream, like Walt Disney. He was dreaming about a, a world made of characters that would bring you know, different qualities of life and fun and entertainment. He was dreaming about that. And it was something huge. And he was you know, making little sketches in his own uh, sketchbook. But he, he manifested that vision. So he realized that whatever was happening inside of him, if you hold it enough time consciously, it will start happening. And this is the message that all the great saints and sages gave us. So this awakening has to do with humanity reaching a certain threshold or critical point where enough beings start perceiving paradise on earth and how that will look like basically we will be moving from competition to cooperation competition to co cooperation yes from division to oneness yes from insensitivity to becoming sensitive to one another from ingratitude to gratitude we won't from, give things instead of focusing ourselves seeing how tightly bound we all are yeah. And separation is the biggest illusion. And I had that breakthrough recently. And I, I saw what it felt like to understand for the first time after reading and teaching so much of that. I saw what it was. I felt it in my inner essence so hard. And I just want to let you guys know watching that we spend most of our time focusing on how other people are different. We spend our time in our ego and in our thoughts so much that we are blinded by the fact that we carry all of this love and energy and universal power and coexistence within us. So it's from shifting from here to here. And that's how I've snapped myself out of it the last few weeks because they've been really difficult for me. And I have been just saying, Leslie, get out of here, sink it to your heart. And it's that intention which mantras are all about intentions. So can you speak to us? Can you give us a couple mantras to take away from this that we can use tonight, tomorrow, when we feel alone, when we feel like we're so caught up in our thoughts that are just recycling over and over? Maybe a mantra to help us pull away from the media and into our hearts instead. What are your favorite mantras or that you can share for new beginners? Yes, one of the most uh, effective mantras and old mantras is called uh, Om Mani Padme. At my home. <laughs> yeah. That's that. an easy mantra, but it's, it's quite powerful. You know, the first syllable, Om, mm -hmm. is connected with the all that is, that oneness field where everything is emerging from. Everything is, is emerging from a oneness field. Actually, there's no matter, it's, there's just energy. And that energy comes together through the amalgamation of vibrations. Yep. And those vibrations are created either by words or by mantra. Mantra also can make that effect. So we say matter is an epiphenomenon of consciousness. It's a result of consciousness. So from the on, we withdraw certain qualities that we want to invoke or nurture within our lives. So money has to do with the Manipura Chakra and our inner power, creative power, an essence of who we are. It's our inner fire. Mm -hmm. That's and, and that's located in the abdomen. That's that's just above the belly button or below the belly button. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, around the belly. 
And basically, that's your your power. That's your creativity. That's where you tame basically all your energy and you know give something that is polished. It's called the lustrous gem, like the diamond that we carry within. So in order to awaken that power within yourself, that everyone has that, everyone has something magnificent to to bring forth in this world. Um, then the the next syllable is called Padme. And then, which means lotus, basically, in Sanskrit. And the lotus is like a state of consciousness because even the highest posture that you can do in yoga, in asana, is called padmasana. So again, padme. So padma is lotus flower that is born out of the dirt, down inside of the water where there's no oxygen, where there's a lot of little fishes trying to eat it up. And it's the mud. Exactly. And out of that mud comes the most beautiful flower that surfaces above the muddy water. And it's also associated with the crown chakra. Thich Nhat Hanh, no mud, no lotus. It's that duality, the polarity. Okay, so keep going. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah, so basically what he's saying within the context of the mantra is that no matter where you are in your journey, you can, you can become gold. You can flower just like the lotus flower is coming out from darkness. You can also come out of darkness and, you know, awaken, basically. And the last syllable, hum, means synthesizing all the wisdom and experiences and methods that you have learned through your life in something that will make you completely solid, stable, and unchanging. Mm. Finding your own truth that is rooted in your heart. You know, in this spiritual world, there's so much information, so many courses, so many teachers, so many paths, so much stuff. But at some point, you should mature to the point where you are your own um, authority and institution and your own truth, basically. Yes. I love that so much because I finally feel like I'm there, Daniel. I finally feel like I'm connected to my helpers, my angels my spiritual teachers, Jesus, Buddha. I mean, they're all there with me. And I, it had to take me being alone in isolation to make that contact again. That's beautiful. So people, please know that if you're, you are alone and you're eating your meals alone and you're waking up alone and you're trying your best, that you truly are surrounded by so much support that you can't see. But if you look inside of yourself by simply saying mantras, by taking time to do whatever makes you feel connected, you will make contact with an army of supporters. Do you, what do you do when you're at home now, isolated, to connect to your teachers you can't see, your angels, your, your, your truth? Yes, totally. I'm doing a lot of events, uh, meditating with the people all over the, the world. I'm doing several events a day and I teach daily also. I, I'm all the time trying to infuse high vibrations to the world, even, even before this. But now it's getting more and more busy. And I'm doing music all the time. Uh, when it comes to my personal practice, uh, I sing mantra, I do pranayamas. Mm -hmm. And I also do visualizations. Uh, I know that whatever I hold into my space of consciousness, especially when I'm in a peaceful state, it manifests in my life. So the next day, usually I start getting all these signs, miracles, and synchronicities. Yes, signs. <laughs> what kind of signs do you get? Because people have been saying that they're getting signs through numbers. How do you get your signs? Because you're just so up there. I'm curious. Well, it's always new. It's, there's a creative flow in also the signs. It's not always the same. Sometimes it has to do with another person saying something that is, exact, is talking to me exactly what I needed to hear. Uh, sometimes it's not getting a sign, the sign. <laughs> <laughs> it's everything. It's everywhere, you know. Whatever you look, the information is there. Then sometimes it could be numbers. Uh, sometimes it's a mantra. Sometimes it's an, an opportunity opening up. Mm -hmm. um, and I have Mike here saying numbers big this month. The numbers started opening up to me the first time when I was 18 years old. And I kept seeing 11, 11, 11, 11 everywhere. I didn't know what it was. And I just, I have a memory now of 
going out with my friends and just saying, I keep seeing the number 11. And now how many years later? I'm 34 now. <laughs> so many years later, they talk to me in different ways where I will be surrounded at a red light with like the number 98. And there'll be a car in front of me, license plate 98, the car behind me 98, the car to my side, the car to my side and, and over there. Like I, I will literally film it because I'm thinking, okay, I'm going crazy. <laughs> and, and, and then I see it on, on my on my phone and I go, okay, that really happened. And so it's the way that they speak through us through numbers. Like you said, like us connecting right now to being reconnected with old friends. And I think the biggest takeaway I'm having right now is that when you keep your vibes high and you truly fight for your freedom, that God aligns you with the people you need to be around. And like, you're an angel. My family, they're angels. And every single person you meet has a lesson to teach you and you to them. Um, okay, so one thing I wanna talk to you about is on your website, which again, can you plug in your website really quick? It's so beautiful, you guys. I'm telling you, you'll be on it for hours. I'm never on websites like that. Like your platform <laughs> is aesthetically beautiful and all your music's there, everything. Um, what's your website name? It's danielbalone.com. Okay, I will plug that in also. Um, but you talked about the yin and yang. And a lot of people who don't practice yoga regularly have heard of yin and yang. And it's the duality, the polarity. Um, oh, I want to read Jennifer's, sorry. I heard twice today about guilt coming up people who are being supported by life. And they feel guilty about things going right without them having to do something to accept goodness. Oh, Jennifer, I think that has to do with self-love and self-acceptance. If you don't feel worthy of that recognition and that praise, you'll never accept it the way it was intended to come to you. So the same way you feel that love, accept it, and maybe your neighbor or your family will then accept it for themselves as well too. Use it and live as an example on how to breathe in all the beauty and all the glory that comes with truly trying to find your truth and being the kind of person. So you deserve it, Jennifer, or your family or whoever. We all deserve it because going back to this duality, there is no right, there is no wrong, there is no hot, there is no cold without the other. So they coexist, this relationship between good and bad, evil and holy. Can you please talk to us about that? Yeah, basically everything contains the seed of the opposite. Like we tend to polarize our experiences and thoughts and the things that we go through. We say this was great or this was terrible but actually in everything terrible, there's something great. And in everything great, there's something terrible. And we tend to overlook that. That's why we keep on bouncing from one end to the other and we don't find the middle path. So when you find the middle path, there's, an, uh, there's a balance within your emotional world that allows you to go even to a deeper state of consciousness. Because you don't have all these highs and lows. You like, it's not that you neglect things or you are not sensitive to things. You are still feeling everything, but you know the truth of it. The mind usually likes to be partial, you know, and exclude vital information. We find what we want to, to see in things. So the yin and yang basically showing you that everything is, is much bigger than we think. It's holistic. It's complete in itself. And there's nothing absolute. There's nothing that is totally one thing or another thing. And that helps us when you look at your life and you had any traumatic situations, maybe you were hurt in the past or you had suffering, you know, whatever it is, or a health problem or a financial problem. And we tend to say like, oh, those moments were really, really bad. But if you look at them in this light, you realize out of that terrible situation, something great happened too. And so that's the wisdom of basically the Tao. Yeah. Can you say that quote again about the seed? Yeah. Everything contains the seed of the opposite. And um, that has, that coincides so beautifully with my journey right now. And I think if we all take a deeper look at how we've gotten ourselves out of situations and certain chapters in our lives, 
how it's always been from a place of suffering, like you said. And that's something I've always read about and studied in Buddhism, but I, I just, I couldn't really quite grasp it until I really had my own experience. Um, okay, so anybody have any questions so far? Any questions at all? I had a couple uh, friends ask me about meditation. How can we use your music in meditation? And what's your norm with meditating? Like, I don't know, what, what can you share with someone that's never meditated before um, on how to connect without all the distractions? Yeah, so meditation is not something that you do. It's something that happens to you when you're in a higher state of consciousness. Whenever you try to meditate, basically the effort is not allowing you to meditate because meditation is not to do something. It's basically to sink into your state of consciousness, whatever it is, to become aware. Uh, sometimes we think, okay, when I sit in meditation, I need to be quiet. I need, uh, you know, to kind of withdraw from the world and not think about my problems. But actually, if you become totally aware of whatever is happening within you, that's a state of meditation. So meditation is a, an expanded state of consciousness, similar to what happened to me when I heard the mantra. You move into a different state where you experience reality uh, beyond the mind. So when you hear the mantras, like what happened to me, your state of consciousness starts expanding because Sanskrit can send a message to the unconscious mind. And the, and the mind responds. That's why you were saying when you play a mantra and you start feeling so relaxed and you go inside. Because it's doing it, the, the words, the vibrations, um, the combination of syllables, the sounds, the Sanskrit itself will push you into an expanded state of consciousness. So if they want to meditate with mantras, basically you can either listen to them and get the benefits or you can chant along. That's a different level because actually you're creating those vibrations within yourself. So you, you go deeper and there are different, way, different ways of chanting them. You can either sing them like a song. Most of the mantras that you hear on my website are uh, done like more like a singer songwriter. Mm -hmm. Or you can chant them in the original intonations. So the Vedas, the ones who were basically revealing these mantras to humanity, they had their own musical scale. It's oh. very, very simple. It's just uh, there's a, a fundamental note and there's a semitone up and a semitone down. Okay. So the whole chanting is super magnetic because it's like, you know, the, the Indian scale, that, that little scale that stays forever in your mind. If you sing a mantra in that scale, then it's very hard not to remember it because it stays. And it's like, repetitive as well. Yeah. Like, I, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to sing a mantra just for you to, okay. to hear the... Om Shri Sarva Deva Param Karuna Param Jyotye Namaha Om Shri Sarva Deva Param Karuna Param Jyotye Namaha Om Shri Sarva Deva Param Karuna Param Jyoti Namaha Om Everyone take a deep breath, please. That's the one. It clears my slate, clears the energy, the trapped energy of resistance. That is a mantra, my friends. That was without a guitar. That was mm, so bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's going through me both. I was like, ah. oh, gosh, thank you so much for that. Thank you. So that's the Vedic scale, basically. It's so simple, but if you hear it again and again, usually we sing mantras in a certain number of repetitions, like 3, 7, 21, 49, 108. 
talk to us about the hurts because you also offer that music on your website. This is the music, you guys. If you YouTube music to help me go to sleep, and it's kind of that digital sounding, long, wavy music with no sound, with no singing. Um, you also compose music like that, and it's on your website, and it's beautifully categorized. That's what I was listening to. So depending on the hurts, it's going to penetrate different parts of your soul. There's some for fear. There's some for anxiety. There's some to help you sleep. So talk to us how this is scientifically, scientifically backed up and how you're able to compose music depending on the frequency. Because whether you know this or not, everything has its own frequency. It's the energy. And music's the same way. And when it's manipulated to be an exact hertz, then it's going to penetrate certain parts of you unconsciously, consciously, everything all around. And I play that music to clear where I'm living because we're pent up in our homes right now. And that energy is being recycled and recycled. And unless you have crystals and unless you're staging every day, um, playing music while you're in the shower or cooking is going to help open up the space in your home. And your music's beautiful. So talk to us about the hurts, the frequency, the vibrations that are all around us that people think you're crazy when you talk about. But again, it's all scientifically backed up. Yeah. It's been known for thousands of years. That's the, the, the duality of it, right? Exactly. And the best thing to do is to try it out because if you're sensitive, you will pick it up immediately. So different vibrations or hertz, basically hertz are cycles per second. Okay. A certain uh, every everything that creates vibration, it's a it's a wave. So it goes, uh, yeah. Uh, it has a positive side and a negative face. So two faces. Okay. So the higher the vibration, the faster the wave, and the shorter the waves. Uh, so if you put it down, like let's say very very uh, low frequencies, the waves are huge. Like they can feel. Chunky. Yeah. Yeah. Super big. Like uh, I don't know, in thirty hertz. It takes like four meters or three meters for you to be able to to have a wave like that. That's why when you play very uh, low end music, your walls vibrate and everything because the vibration is just resonating. Yeah, the bass. Uh, so there's an original solfeggio, like uh, music is composed basically on solfeggio uh, scales. And that scale was a little bit off to the original uh, natural solfeggio, which came out, uh, I think, like 30 years ago. Uh, some scientists started talking about that and the effects that music has on consciousness. So they started tuning their instruments to different frequencies. Didn't that also happen during World War II in the operas and everything? Yeah, exactly. Germany and Europe, right? Yes. So basically, when you're exposed to a certain uh, particular vibration, like let's say, I don't know, 528 hertz, that's the miracle tone. Basically, uh, scientists observe that your DNA repairs very fast and absorbs light. They could observe it in plants who were doing the photosynthesis. Right. They could absorb much more light than a plant that was not exposed to that frequency. And this music's all available on your website. It's free online. Yeah. It's so relaxing and soothing, and it really does penetrate every area of the space that it's exposed to. I love that. Yeah, it's amazing. It really, it's wonderful. If you go on YouTube, the same songs are looped for three hours, four hours. Yeah. Sometimes you just want to go to sleep and put on the headphones and, you know, you'll be out in 30 minutes or 20 minutes, no matter how crazy your day was. It's like it really puts you out and... And that vibration keeps on working on you throughout the night or even throughout the day if you want to clean your space or work there. It's so true. It helps It helps you sleep better. It clears the energy in your home. It enhances your spiritual journey. And um, I think just to go to the duality and the polarity of it all, because I love rock music. I love alternative. I love all sorts of music. But just kind of being more aware now of that frequency and state of mind it can get you into um, I think that goes to say is be careful or just be observant of what you surround yourself with the images the music the relationships how did you notice that changing in your life once you started dedicating yourself to finding your truth 
how did you notice relationships shedding um, or things shifting to a different level? Yes, the moment you change your own vibration, you start attracting different people to your life. And we, are, we all have different goals and objectives and dreams in our lives. Uh, if, you, if you circle your life around contribution, that's one of the biggest awakenings I had. I realized that the purpose of life is to serve others. Actually, one of the definitions of hell is the place where you cannot serve anyone. You have no, no opportunity to help others. And when you do it here, we have so many opportunities in this planet to be of service to others. Actually, you're not only doing it for the others, you also get so much in return. Because every time you help anyone become happier, you get happier too. Absolutely. So I, karma, instant. There's instant karma. I've had it before, both negative and positive. And karma actually is the the best kind of currency and wealth because you will carry it through your life and it will become handy. You never know when you need the good karma. Like you can have a financial crisis and then you have a lot of good karma. Well, something's going to happen to you and you will land up in your feet. Yeah, on your feet. Everything's going to work out. Or maybe you are, um, you know, it doesn't matter. It, it just comes to you at the right time when you need it the most. So if you have a lot of good karma, everything will happen. You will fulfill your dreams. You will grow spiritually. You'll be able to, to move into states of joy, peace, serenity. Um, all the beautiful states that we are looking for in meditation happen if you have good karma. Otherwise, you can enter in and out. But to be able to live in a state like that, uh, contribution needs to be at the core of your being. So you move from self-centered actions to other-centered actions. And the more you do it, the more you like it. And that became like a theme of my life. You know, how can I serve more? How can I bring um, more goodness to this world? And that's when everything changed. My relationships, the kind of work that I do, uh, what I do on a daily, you know, every day. The moment I wake up, I, I start thinking like this. I start teaching. I start composing songs. And I think how this will benefit people. I started studying more and more these frequencies. So everything started circulating around contribution. Serving others. Yeah, and so if you're at home and you feel like you don't have anything to contribute, if you feel, I mean, we're talking to such an amazing musician here. You've been to over 30 countries spreading your music and you've been on this mission of trying to bring mantra to mainstream. And I think it's totally possible. And I think when you talked about the golden age, we are here. It's happening. The shift of consciousness, the duality of dark, of fear and love is more apparent than ever. And I see it in my relationships with people I'm close to. I see how I talk to one person and I'm bombarded with fear and worry. And it's, it's all coming from love though. And then I talk to other people that are feeling empowered because they're able to see beyond what's being shown in the screen or the media and because they've tuned inward. So if you're at home and you, and you know, we're trying to send the message that do what you can to contribute to others and it will contribute to yourself. Just know that it's anything as simple as giving a smile to a stranger. It's anything as simple as recognizing somebody else because at the end of the day, all we want is to be recognized. Yes. We want that approval. And you don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to be intelligent. You just have to be compassionate and aware. So I hope that taking any knowledge away from today's conversation with you is that if you want to find happiness, you have to cultivate it. And if you don't know how to find it within yourself, give it to someone else. Yes, that always works. And it comes back to you. Many people don't know uh, their life's mission. They say, how do you discover your path, you know, your, your soul's purpose? And I think the best way to do it is to start serving others, however you can. Because at the end of the day, once you find your mission, the core of your mission will be contribution. Because of the core of any great vision is contribution. Uh, that's the secret. If you start doing it beforehand, everything will fall into place. You, you'll be pulled into your dharma. 
into your path. And once you find your path, you will grow spiritually like a rocket. You'll go up and up and up. And you'll start carrying people with you. And once we have enough uh, human beings having this experience, this world is going to change drastically. We're going to start seeing a paradise out there. People are going to connect with each other. We're going to work together to create a happy world, basically. Happy human beings create a happy world. But so far, it's like um, the, the energies of fear are stronger yet. So we need, to, yeah, we need to overcome that. We need to have more and more people have these kind of conversations and awareness and try to inquire deeper into the meaning of life, which is a great time to do now because it's happening anyway. Since we are all you know, at home and thinking what's going to be humanity and the future and actually our lives. So this is a time to dream with the world that we want to create. And we need to go out there once things go back to the new normal uh, with a vision. And that vision should be to create a better world because otherwise we're gonna land up in the same place or worse. It's a time for a change and the change has to do with connecting with yourself, finding your peace, finding your happiness, sharing what you have with the world. And from there, everything is automatic. It starts pulling you into a loop of beautiful things and miracles and synchronicities and more growth and more beautiful people come and, and join you it's just a wonder to live a life like that. It is. And uh, another thing that I want to share is I'm starting to see that truth. But in between that truth and that lotus flower, I'm still living in the mud at the same time. And I'm still suffering every day. And I'm still contemplating every day. And there's that saying, like, the phoenix rises above the ash. I don't even know what a phoenix really is. It's a bird, but... But for some reason, I know, I know that that has been brought to my attention so many times because that will happen to me and I will have a deeper understanding of that truth. And the more that you're on your own spiritual journey or that inner connection to what your God is, what your spiritual entities are, the more you're going to begin to find more truth in these sayings. So if what we're saying you've heard a hundred times or, or one time, understand that you're going to resonate with that at the perfect frequency at the perfect time. And um, if anyone has any questions, if anyone wants to know more about meditation, if anyone wants to know more about mantra music, this is something even more simplistic than meditating. This is something you can have on your phone while cleaning, while washing the dishes. And it's something that's going to clear that your home so that you set your own intentions. Speaking of intentions, mantra music, we went through Om Man and Padme. But can we give maybe an English version um, that people can keep with them to come to during times of darkness or insecurity or fear. Yes. Um, you can repeat to yourself. You can bring your, the middle finger into the center of your heart and repeat to yourself uh, internally, I am safe. Oh, I love that. I am safe. Just like this, yeah? Yeah. I am safe. I am safe and, and feel it actually. Not only tell it to yourself and, and feel that you are safe because it's true. You're not trying to convince yourself of something that is crazy. It's, it's true. Um, you're safe. And once you feel safe, everything feels different. And at the, end of, at the end of the day, we'll be here in this planet as long as we need to be. And when the time to go comes, it doesn't matter where you are or what's happening out there, you know, anything can take you. You know, it's up to the higher consciousness uh, to know when your time is up. But up until then, you're safe. You're where you have to be. There's a purpose for you being here. And that purpose is for you to discover love, to discover who you are, to bring that love to the world. That's why we come here again and again. Absolutely. Absolutely. So please be aware that we're going to be having dark moments during this time. We're going to be having times where we feel so uplifted and we're singing and we're dancing. And then we're going to have moments where we feel dark, lost, worried, anxious, but negative thoughts are very powerful, just as positive thoughts. So don't sit in those feelings too long. It's about purging them out. It's about experiencing them and releasing them and then holding on to the good. And if you don't believe it, if you're not quite feeling it, say it out loud, just like you said. I, it was the middle finger? 
Yes. I am safe. I am safe. I've also had those moments and I intuitively knew this because I was in bed full of fear and darkness and I went to sleep saying the words, I choose love over and over. And it's the same exact thing. So your mantra can be whatever you want it to be. Yes. Be, I choose love. I am safe. But come back to your heart. Your thoughts are going to drive you nuts. And they're not real. They're not you. They're part of you. But sink to your heart. Shift it down. And say what you need to say to calm yourself and bring you back to that safe, loving space. Amen. <laughs> Before we close off, I want to, and I'm going to post this onto my, my Instagram, but um, you have a Wednesday challenge that you have going on on your website. Yes. And so it starts from $5 to a donation of $40, but it's so beautiful and it can help people understand more of your mantra, manifestations, affirmations, conscious living in such a beautiful way as you explain it. So us to the, uh, about that for a little bit. Yes, it's about yes. the journey of mantra and how you can really use it in your life. And it's a whole yoga. Um, yoga has different steps. And so there I'm teaching in depth how to really uh, make this part of your life, of your lifestyle. For me, yoga is not something that I do for a meditation. It's my lifestyle. It's something when I'm sitting, I'm usually sitting in lotus pose. Uh, <laughs> Just because it feels much greater, I feel much more flow of energy. I, I feel more connected. I'm more intelligent. I'm more present. Uh, so I'm teaching people how to use mantras in their lives, different kind of mantras. Because mantras are like, uh, you know, like very sharp, precise tools. There are mantras for different purposes. There are so many aspects of the one consciousness. So if we want to nurture success, there's a mantra. If we want to nurture awareness, there's a mantra. If we want to nurture gratitude, there's a mantra. If we need wealth, there's another mantra. So through this class, I'm trying to teach people how to shape their lives through their conscious um, creations. By and short words. Yeah. Simple, yeah. Short words, either they're in Sanskrit that you're teaching them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Sanskrit is different because it really pins into your unconscious and it creates a, an effect in the unconscious that is much more powerful than the conscious mind. And because they have been, actually we all share one collective human mind. There's not your mind or my mind. We have different brains, but the mind is one. So these mantras are being stored in the collective human mind. And whenever you sing in Sanskrit, you are connected with a a pool of energy that has been nurtured for thousands of years. So it will hit you like a, like a lightning bolt. I mean, English is so relatively new and Sanskrit's over 5,000 years old. Yes. Beyond, you said, right? Yes. And it has power. So and it's a conscious language. It's a vibrational language. English is different. When you talk in English, you don't move into a state of... Uh, expanded consciousness just like Sanskrit. In Sanskrit, when you start singing in Sanskrit, it's very hard to talk after that because you need to use a different part of your brain to connect with the logic thinking. So in the concert, usually I sing a mantra and then I try to give a little explanation of the next mantra and it's so hard to talk because my brain is kind of out, you know, I'm experiencing, I'm not thinking. That's so interesting. I, I, I didn't know that there was that variation there too, that duality back again with the yin and yang. Yeah, your brain functions completely different when you sing in Sanskrit and when you, think, when you sing in English or any other language whatsoever. Some ancient languages like Hebrew also have that. Um, there, there are other languages. There's Gurumukhi, it's another language from the, the northern part of India. It also produces the same. And different cultures have power languages. So basically it uses your brain in a totally different way. Oh, I love that. Ah. It's so good. And it's, there's so much knowledge we can take away. There's so much knowledge that we focus on rather than focusing on distractions to numb us. Let's focus on something that can empower us. Let's focus on something that can bring us closer to being a collective consciousness of understanding the true meaning of love and self-love and self-nurturing in acts of mantra and acts of affirmation and acts of kindness. So your Wednesday challenge is available on your website. Your music is available on YouTube. 
Um, would you mind ending our beautiful conversation with some singing? Yeah, sure. Let's sing the Om Mani Padme Hum. Okay, and you guys, if, if you want to get comfortable, oh, you're getting the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, if you want to get comfortable, dim the lights, um, get get into a quiet space, get comfortable. I invite you all to close your eyes and experience mantra music with Daniel. <laughs> Um, hey, I'm ready. Let's do it. Take a deep breath. You got five seconds left. Thank you so much.